Hey, everybody, we're going to pick up our conversation we started last week. So if you haven't listened to last week's episode, go back and listen to that episode, and then you can listen to this episode. This is part two of a two-part series. Uh, I hope you enjoy. Welcome to The Friday Habit with Benjamin Manley and Mark Labriola II. The Friday Habit is for creators, entrepreneurs, and agency owners looking for actionable ideas on how to grow their business and be more profitable. We'll pull from our combined knowledge of over 20 years and interview thought leaders that will inspire you and give you the motivation you need to kick your business into high gear. Buckle up. It's Friday. Well, okay. I heard you talking about like the six P's, you know, so can you walk us through kind of what those are? It sounds like those are the different things you need to keep in mind when you're trying to sell a business or the, the six factors that people, is that how, what it is? The six P's are your infrastructure. It is your foundation. Okay. Got when it. When you build a house, when, when, a con, when, a, when a contractor builds a house, what do they need to do? They dig deep, right? Yeah. And make a foundation. They dig really deep. They put in the AC, they put in electrical, they put in all the wiring. They dig really deep. They make the foundation. If they don't do that, what happens when a strong wind comes by? <laughs> yeah, it's going kind to of fall over, probably. This is what happens with businesses all the time because most business owners concentrate on sales, sales, sales. Right. And they don't concentrate on building the infrastructure. So if you concentrate on sales and you don't build a solid infrastructure, your, your whole business is going to come crashing down around yep. you. And you're not going to be able to sustain and you're not going to be able to support the, the customers, hmm. your clients. So these are the six P's. I'm going to also, when I go through the six P's, mm-hmm. I'm going to also tell you the biggest mistakes business owners make when I tell you the six P's. Uh, please. I love it. Thank you. One of the biggest mistakes that business owners make is they've created a glorified job that they go to work at every day. <laughs> yep. This is a business that works for them. So yep. they are the business. The business is a thousand percent dependent upon them. Like I told you about this ladies who, whose husband um, died from a heart attack. So the number one P is people. You don't grow a business, you grow people, people build the business. Hmm. Entrepreneurs have habits that they need to break. <laughs> one of the big entrepreneur habits is their mindset. They think if I want it done right, I have to do it myself. So they have their finger on every pie. Well, that can't be further from the truth. You will never grow unless you let go of the control. Right. Entrepreneurs are not good at everything. There's three to five things that you're going to be really, really, really good at. The rest of it you need to delegate. And entrepreneurs have to stop working in their business and start working on their business. So people's yep. number one. You have to make sure you have the right people in the right seats. Now, a lot of businesses have the right people, but they're trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. And, 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 and I found myself, I've done this too, fit a square peg into a round hole and, you know, I'll tell one of my employees, well, why aren't you doing that? You could be doing that. And then I got to say, stop it, Michelle. They're not made that way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So you got to make sure you put the right person in the right seat and you got to ask the who question. Who opens the doors? Who handles customer service, marketing, legal, accounting? Who takes care of the phones? Who takes care of manufacturing, logistics, environmental, quality control? The list goes on and on. The clue, Ben, is that you should never be next to the who. As simple as it sounds, everybody needs to write the who's down in their company, every single who, and mm-hmm. assign a name next to that who. And one person can maybe handle 25 who's, you know, but you should not be next to the who. We're really trying to build a business <laughs> to run without you. Yep, I love it. That's number one, people. You're not going to get anywhere if you don't build people. Right. Because all you'll have is just a job that you, go, that you work at in every day. You've got to yep. have people. So the second P is product. When I wrote, wrote my, so just to give you all a little history lesson here, when I wrote my very first book, Sell Your Business for Morning's Fourth in 2013, I did the research and learned that 90% of all startups would fail. Within mm-hmm. those first one to five years is the most risky. But when I wrote Exit Rich and did the exact same research, I was flabbergasted to learn that the business landscape has flip-flopped. Mm-hmm. Only 30% of startups will go out of business now. Only 30%. But really? out of twenty seven point six, yes, that's a fact. <laughs> out of twenty seven point six million companies, those businesses have been in business for ten years or longer. Seventy percent of them will go out of business. Seventy. It used to be that you could be in business five, ten, fifteen, twenty years, and you're going and you're going to be in business every year right. uh, for, for years to come. That's not the case anymore. Listen to the media. What does the media always talk about? Toys R Us in business seventy five years goes under. Kmart, Steinmart, Pier 1, Godiva Chocolate closing down, 
Disney stores are closing down. GNC is closing down 900 locations. But guess what? They only talk about the public companies. They're not telling me about the private businesses. These private business owners are exiting poor. Hmm. They're selling for pennies on the dollar. They're closing their business. And even worse, many of them are filing bankruptcy. This was before the pandemic. The number one reason for that is because business owners stopped doing what I call AIM, lack of AIM. AIM, A-I-M, is always innovate and market. Mm -hmm. Always innovate and market. Business owners stop innovating. Toys R Us did nothing different in 75 years. Blockbuster, what do they do to innovate? They had the opportunity to buy Netflix twice. Sure. And they sat back and did nothing. Innovation is key. The problem is business owners are married to their original concept. They want to keep doing things the way they've always done them. You're either growing or dying. There's no in between. Sure. So products is your product, your service, your industry. You know, the the hospitality industry died during the pandemic. (laughs) You know, so you really want to look at your industry, your product, and ask yourself, is it on the way up or on the way out? Do you have an Amazon? Ben, if you have an Amazon, you need to sell. (laughs) Because businesses follow life cycles just like humans do, and nothing lasts forever. So if you have an Amazon, you sell. You sell when you're in your prime. If you Mm -hmm. have a Blockbuster, you don't sell. (laughs) You figure out how to pivot. Right. Right. And I always, I always tell my clients, ask these three transformational questions. Amazon did this back in the 90s. Ask yourself, what business are you in? Mm-hmm. Amazon said, we're in the fulfillment business. We fulfill book orders. Second question, what do you do better than everybody else? What's your core competencies? What's your USP, mm-hmm. your unique selling proposition? And Amazon said, we do fulfillment better than everyone else in the world. The third most obvious question, and everyone should go through this exercise, the third most obvious question is what business should we be in? Mm-hmm. Should. And Amazon said, ding, 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 we need, to be, right. we need to be in a fulfillment business fulfilling products for everyone all around the world. Those three transformational questions transformed Amazon from a small book fulfillment center to the multi-billion dollar worldwide conglomerate that they are today. Yeah. So... Hmm. These are these are huge questions, and the other the other reason that, that people get in trouble trouble with products is because they have one profit center. Hmm. You can't have one profit center. I was just talking to a, uh, somebody the other day that does web design. It does exactly what you do. Mm-hmm. They have one way they get paid. Web design. They have no other profit centers. Restaurants got in big trouble during the pandemic because they have one way that they make money. Patrons come in and eat, or they take food to go. you got to have multiple congruent revenue streams. Yep. Or you're at risk. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, diversify your revenue streams. So that's product. So we got people, we got product number two. Your favorite, processes. Yes, I love it. Thank you. Processes. (laughs) So processes are typically like exit strategies. A lot of business owners don't think about them until something bad happens in their company. Like, oh, my gosh, we need a process for that. Mm-hmm. No, you need a process before the shit hits the fan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And most business owners get this wrong too because most business owners design their processes around their own agenda. Mm-hmm. Around the owner's agenda. I'll give you an example. Doctor's offices. When are doctor's offices open? I guess during the day, usually. When we work and when we run our companies, nine to five. Do they design their hours around the patient's schedule or do they design around the doctor's agenda? And usually they close Friday at noon, yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Here's another time you should get a pen and paper. (laughs) You need to ask yourself three questions. What do you want your clients to experience? Come up with three things you want them to experience. And design your processes around your customer's experience, not your own agenda. So good, yes. McDonald's did that in 1950. Did you ever watch the movie The Founder based upon the McDonald brothers? Uh, Yes, I did. It's been a while, but I did see that, yep. It's a great movie, right? Hey, a movie about your story, just like you like. Exactly. So (laughs) the McDonald brothers back in 1950 said, we're going to design a fast food restaurant because there wasn't one. We're going to design a process around a customer's experience. We want a customer's experience these three things. Great tasting food that's hot, Fast, mm-hmm. 30 seconds or less. They did that in 1950. Now, even though the processes have been tweaked along the way, it is the reason that you can eat at a McDonald's anywhere in the world and get great tasting food that's hot fast. 
Yep. They never said it's going to be great customer service because their customer service is pretty bad. <laughs> they never said it's going to be healthy food and good for you. They said it's going to be hot, fast, and taste good. Okay. Yep. So you need to ask yourself, what do you want your customers to experience? Because whoever creates wow experiences for their clients is the company that's winning. Mm -hmm. Amazon's winning because they make it so easy to practically buy anything. You can practically buy a horse on Amazon and have it delivered in two days. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So you need to go back to asking your customers, what do you want? What do you need? How can I make it easier for you to do business with us? I love that. So your processes must be designed with the customer experience in mind, productive, efficient, and you know this, systematic. You need the Burger King of business. You need a McDonald's system of business. You need a Chick-fil-A system of business. You got to have those processes, SOP checklist per department. Everything needs to be automated. Yep. Makes sense. All right. So that's, that's the first question. So we got processes. What do you want your clients to experience? Do you have more questions under that or are we moving on to P number four? Well, what do you want your clients to experience? Come up with three. Yeah. Okay. Got and it. then if you can't figure it out, Ask your clients, <laughs> yep. what do you need? Yeah. What do you want? Exactly. How can Talk I make it easier for you to do business with me? Okay, so the fourth P is proprietary. This is the highest value driver. So let me give you a crash course in valuations. Businesses that have under a million dollars in EBITDA will typically trade for one to three, three and a half times EBITDA. All companies get multiples of EBITDA, seller's discretionary earnings, or net income. The only industry that gets a multiple of revenues, this is where everybody gets confused, okay. is the SaaS industry. SaaS industry gets a multi multiple of revenues. Okay. So companies that have over a million EBITDA, your, your goal, Ben, and everybody, and you might already be there, Ben, I don't know, but everybody's goal is to get that company over a million EBITDA. You know why? Why? Because that's where all the buyers are. Okay. There's more buyers for good businesses than there are good businesses to buy. That's where all the bidding wars start. So over a million in EBITDA, then it typically starts at five multiple and up, okay. depending upon these proprietary assets. So there's six pillars here, six pillars to proprietary. Can I ask you a question? So you say if it's a million in EBITDA, then you're saying from the million in EBITDA, then one to three times that is what the purchase price would be potentially what you can sell it for? Under a million in EBITDA. Under a million okay, in EBITDA. Under. So when you get to a million, yeah, what happens? Over a million in EBITDA, it typically starts at five and up. Okay, so if you have over a million EBITDA, then potentially you could sell your business for five million or more. Correct. Okay, cool. All right, sorry to interrupt you. Just want to clarify that. That's okay. And then, what drives value are these proprietary assets? Hmm. So there's six pillars to proprietary. Number one is branding. The more well branded you are, the more I can sell your company for, as long as your brand is relevant in the mind of the consumer. Is anybody spending any money on Blockbuster? Is anybody going to buy the Blockbuster brand? Right, probably not. <laughs> that would be a big fat no, because <laughs> they would yeah. block us. There's nothing to buy there. Mm -hmm. um, the most valuable brand in the world is? Uh, Apple, maybe? Just guessing. Apple is right. $359 billion. You won the prize. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> so you won the prize. $359 billion. Guess what? That doesn't include the EBITDA. It uh, doesn't include assets, inventory, real estate, or anything else. That's just a brand alone. Wow. Trademarking. Trademarking is huge. Trademark your company name, your um, slogans, anything that's unique to you, like the six Ps, your podcast, your products. People forget to trademark their products. But here's a mistake that business owners make. They think of a company name. They go to GoDaddy. They put it in. They're like, yes, I got the .com. And then they go to their state, and they get the state trademark. But they don't check the federal database. Hmm. So I've seen lots of companies where they're in business for five years, seven years, all of a sudden receive a system to assist letter, and they have to stop using that company name. Hmm. So you have to protect your IP. Get a federal trademark. It's only about 1500 to 2000 Do you have a federal trademark on your podcast, Ben? Uh, I do not. Okay, I'll go get it and sell it back to you. <laughs> well, well, thank you. <laughs> so everybody needs to get a federal trademark. We have a company that we're selling between 50 to $60 million right now. Mm -hmm. They have 12 products. Each product has a federal trademark. Mm -hmm. Each product has exclusivity. One's exclusive to Walmart. One's exclusive to TJ Maxx. One's exclusive to Target. Okay? So you got to protect this IP. Also, your patents. If you have anything unique, get a patent on that. Do you watch Shark mm -hmm. Tank? Uh, sometimes, yeah. I've seen a few episodes. 
Every single, every single shark always asks the same question. Do you have a patent on that? Do you have a patent pending? We sold a company for $18 million. Hmm. It wasn't making that much money, but it had 18 patents. Right. So wow. patents are very valuable. Now, here's, here's another mistake that business owners make. They take their trademarks, their patents, all this stuff, and they put it in the same LLC with their corporation. Don't do that. You need a separate holding company for all of your intellectual property. Huh, interesting. I didn't know that. If you get sued, then you don't want to lose those proprietary assets because of that lawsuit. You want to make sure you have a separate entity. Makes sense. And then contracts are very important, like manufacturing contracts, vendor contracts, distribution contracts, franchisee contracts, client contracts, especially in digital and e-commerce businesses. Many of them will have subscription models with reoccurring revenue. Buyers will pay more money for that. But here's the mistake the business owners make with contracts. 98% of all sales are asset sales. I've never seen a business owner get this right. You need to have that two-sentence transferability clause in your contract that says this contract is transferable upon a new entity. Hmm. Because if your buyer doesn't agree to a stock sale and you can't get your clients to sign consent to transfer, then your deal is going to fall apart. Hmm. I, I'm working with a, a company, it's an, a, actually a digital agency. It's got 2,000 clients, all on contract. Wow. Do you think they're going to go to 2,000 clients to get consent to transfer to sign? No. Right. <laughs> and no. guess what? They don't have the transferable, transferable language. Wow. So that's a big mistake the business owners make. That's huge. Okay. Good to know. Databases. Databases. You can be losing money. And sell your company for millions or billions. Facebook paid $19 billion for WhatsApp. And WhatsApp was hemorrhaging money, but they had a billion users. So wow. Facebook knew they could monetize an ROI on that investment. Hmm. Interesting. And then um, celebrity endorsements. We have a client that's got products with Oprah. Strategists will pay a lot of money with that because, for that because everybody wants to get their products in front of the queen of everything. So, uh, radio personalities, e-commerce, pos website positionings. People don't realize how valuable. Let's say you manufacture pillows and you're number one on Wayfair. Or you manufacture vacuum cleaners and you got the top three spots on Amazon. Digital positioning is huge. Mm. Um, digital real estate is huge. Let's say you got a We sold a skincare company because celebrities and radio personalities can only endorse one vertical. So we had a skincare company that had all these premium positions with all these different radio personalities and nobody could bump them off. Wow. Interesting. So there's more. Content, here's another thing. Let me give you one more mistake that business owners make in proprietary. They hire interns or they go to freelance or they go to Fiverr and they hire um, contractors to write their blogs and their articles, press releases, etc. They don't own the content. You do not own that content. You have to have every one of your contractors sign a agreement that states that you the company owns the content. I've seen lots of lots of contractors and business owners get in horrible lawsuits because of that. Gotcha. But that doesn't and account for uh, full-time employees or W-4, just contractors? Yeah, well, full-time employees, it's fine because I work under your umbrella. Right. But when it's, when it's interns mm -hmm. or 1099s or, like I said, you know, anybody off of Freelance or Fiverr or any of those companies. Logos, too. Logos, too. Make sure you own your logo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, so we got four. We got people, we got product, we got processes, we got proprietary. And I know uh, we only have you for a little while, so maybe you can tell us about the last two Ps. The last two are very quick. The last two are very quick. Patreons is your customer base. Most businesses follow the 80-20 rule, where 80% of their business comes from 20% of their clients. Most mm. business owners have customer concentration, not customer diversification. We sold a media digital agency company. We were set. Well, let me let me say that again. We were trying to sell mm -hmm. <laughs> for between ten and fifteen million. They have five clients, and the reason they only have five clients is because they cater to casinos. They lost two clients in the process. Their revenues dropped in half. Their EBITDA dropped in half. They were no longer sellable. We ended up merging them with another media company. Mm. And then the last P is profits. We're all in business to make money. But lack of profits is never your problem. Lack of profits is a symptom of not running on one of the other five Ps. Clients come to me all the time to say, Michelle, I got a profit problem. I'm like, no, you got a people problem. No, you got a process problem. So lack of profits are never the problem. They're a symptom of. If you're running on all five Ps, Ben, 
You're going to be profitable. It's almost foolproof. Anybody will be profitable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is this is so good. I really appreciate you talking through this stuff with us. Um, I have a couple quick takeaways I want to share with the audience just to summarize kind of what you said. Uh, I love what you said about take the time to figure out your destination, figure out where you are now, and then figure out where you want to be. I love the advice of getting an annual valuation checkup from an M&A expert. That seems like a really good idea and kind of common sense when you say it out loud. The six P's that you covered were people, finding the right people and putting them in the right places. Product, always innovate and market your product. Processes, think about what do you want your clients to experience and pick three things. Proprietary, uh, so things like branding, databases, celebrity endorsements, patents, digital positioning, content. Make sure you have ownership of your proprietary stuff. Patrons, uh, make sure that you're not like relying on just a couple clients for your revenue. Sometimes people have 80% of revenue coming from 20% of your clients and you need to fix that. And then profits, usually if you don't have profits, it's a symptom of the problem and not the problem itself. Man, so good. That was all really, really helpful. I really appreciate you talking with us on this stuff. If you were to say like one action item that our audience can take right now to kind of succeed in this, like what would what would that action item be to get started with some of this stuff? I think right now let's get crystal clear on what you want and hmm. start with the STGPS exit model. Because once you start with the STGPS exit model and follow that to a T and determine who your buyers are going to be, that's going to help you determine where your numbers need to be. Mm-hmm. And that's going to help you determine what synergies you need to build to sell for maximum value when you're ready. Okay. And how can somebody get started with that? What would be the first step? Is there somewhere they can look at that exit model? Is that in your book? Well, it's or? in my book, Exit Rich. It's an, you know, an entire chapter. We just gave the steps of what to do. But... To go dive deeper, you're right, because that, that's high level, right? Yep. To dive, dive deeper and figure out where the numbers need to be, if you want to sell for $20 million, where right. your numbers need to be for your specific industry, you need to contact an M&A advisor like us, and we'll walk you through it. And we'll say, okay, well, if you want to sell for this in your industry, this is exactly where your numbers need to be, and these are the synergies that these buyers are looking for, and this is how you build it. So you would... Start high level and then call an M&A expert to walk you through the rest. Got it. All right. Well, where can people find out more about you and what you're up to and, and buy your book and things like that? So my main website is SilerTucker.com, SilerTucker.com. And they can get Exit Rich at ExitRichBook.com. Um, for anyone that lives in the United States, I encourage you to go to ExitRichBook.com. If you live outside the United States, go to Amazon. But just a little bit about Exit Rich. It was endorsed by Steve Forbes. It says, Exit Rich is a goal mine for entrepreneurs as they leave way too much money on the table. And Sharon Lecter is my co-author. Have you heard of Sharon Lecter? Mm-hmm. Yep. She wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad with Robert Kiyosaki. She's a CPA and financial literacy expert and advisor to many different presidents. She writes Mentors Corner after each chapter. And uh, Kevin Harrington is original Shark on Shark Tank, writes a forward. So Exit Rich, just to clarify, is not about selling your business. Got it. Exit Rich is about building a sellable asset. Got <laughs> it's it. It's about Got building it. a business that's sustainable that you can scale. And when you're ready, you won't be caught in the 80% of businesses that never sell. Got so it. So you can get Exit Rich at ExitRichBook.com. For $24.79 plus shipping, we'll email you the digital download. We'll send a hard cover to your doorstep. And then we will give you that a lifetime membership in the Exit Rich Book Club where there's video content and me doing deep dives and these different techniques and strategies that I've been teaching for the last 20 years, plus documents, documents to operate your business, documents to sell your company. We have sample employee handbooks, org charts, policy and procedure manuals, sample 11 tents, purchase agreements, due diligence checklists, closing documents, all the documents you need to operate and sell your business are there for your review and download. And then these documents yep. cost you over $50,000 if you try to recreate. I know because I've, I've spent the money to create them all. <laughs> hey, there's and your proprietary stuff right there. You've got it. Exactly. <laughs> and then we also, we also will give you a 30-day free membership in the club CEOs which is an entrepreneurship online mastermind where we ask those transformational questions so we can help you pivot and build that sustainable, scalable, and sellable business. Now, if you want to buy Exit Rich at your favorite bookstore like Barnes & Noble or your local bookstore or Amazon or something like that, that's fine. Just email me the information with the receipt and I will still make sure you get the bonuses. 
man, that is so much value. I really appreciate you going through all that with us. I definitely recommend you all check it out. I, I checked out the website and I'm going to be signing up there, exitrichbook.com. Thank you for being on. Uh, man, really appreciate you talking with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah. So everybody just go to the fridayhabit.com to find show notes for this episode and links to Michelle's website. And you also find links to Mark and I's websites and ways to get in touch. And at the very bottom of the page, you can download our guide to the Friday Habit System that will help you set aside one full day each week dedicated to working on your business instead of in your business. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave us a review in the Apple Podcast app. If you have a question, just shoot it to hello at the fridayhabit.com. Thanks for listening. And until next time, live every day like it's Friday. 